This week we're going to be talking about one last view of knowledge, a relativist view of the semantics of knowledge descriptions. So relativism, you'll probably have come across in some form or other. It's a very old view in philosophy. Some forms of relativism go back to just ancient Greek philosophy. But we're going to be presenting relativism as approached from some using some of the tools from formal semantics, which we've kind of been smuggling into the picture as we've been going along. So one thing that we're going to see is that arguably, using tools from philosophy of language, we get a workable version of the idea that whether you can be truly said to know something is a relative matter. The first thing we're going to do, though, is think about what reasons you might have to go in for a relativism about truth. Or put differently, what are the problems with the other views that we've seen so far? So the main alternatives to relativism about truth are going to be contextualism, which we've been talking about for a number of weeks now, and moderate sensitive invariantism, which we started to also introduce recently. The main objection to contextualism is going to be one that we've sort of skirted along in our previous discussions. And it's that it looks like contextualism has trouble making sense of disagreement between non-skeptics and skeptics. So it looks like, as a matter of fact, when non-skeptics encounter skeptics, they disagree about whether knowledge claims are true. And we're going to see it's actually hard for the contextualist to make sense of that. On the contextualist view, it looks like they should just be talking past each other and not having a real disagreement at all. They're just confused. The main objection to invariantism we're going to cover is really the one that we already saw last time. Invariantism makes this odd prediction that knowledge gets destroyed once you do skeptical reasoning or once you do lottery reasoning. And while you may or may not be able to stomach that, it's worth seeing are there other views that do better than contextualism but also don't commit us to this weird phenomenon of knowledge being destroyed. So those are going to be the motivations for looking for a new view. After we do that, we're going to do some philosophy of language. Because one of the things McFarlane wants to emphasize is that once you've done a certain amount of philosophy of language, and once you start thinking about the notion of truth that we need for doing philosophy of language, the idea that truth should be relative to a bunch of different things starts to become a lot less scary. So classically, this has been the kind of objection to relative truth. The worry has been, how do you make sense of the idea that truth is relative in the first place? What we're going to see is that actually everybody who does philosophy of language is committed to truth being relative in some way. Now, McFarlane does think there's going to be an important distinction between the way he's doing it and the way that other semantics do it. But his idea is going to be, given the, think, the kinds of ways we have to relativize truth already, there's actually not that much of a conceptual leap in becoming a relativist in his sense. So we're going to get into this point in considerable detail. We're going to talk about a particular case study that he talks about in the chapter. And that's about the, the, the difference in the way that some temporal expressions refer. So by looking at this in detail, we'll see that we actually need to complicate our notion of truth to make it relative, not just to contexts, which we've already done, but we also need to make it relative to time. It needs to be relative to these two kinds of things. And more generally, the more general point we'll get is that truth needs to be relativized both to contexts and to these other things called indices. Once we've done that, we can then move on to, to relativism itself and spell out what it means for truth to be relative or what it means in McFarlane's terms for it to be assessment sensitive and see what does an assessment sensitive view of knowledge amount to. And we'll see actually it looks quite familiar. It's very close in some ways to the Lewisian contextualism we've been talking about all along. Once we do that, we'll talk about how relative truth um, really gets going by connecting it to the notions of assertion and rejection. Once we do that, we'll then finally be in a position to see why the view is supposed to do better than its alternatives.